don't even know what you're trying to say. Who's the top goal scorer in the OPDL league? Stefan's probably thinking, I was not ready for those questions. <laughs> so I was built for that. This game is set for one fall between Morgan and Stefan. Amitrich, where are we going to go? They rely on producing, developing players to sell them because I would say that's the only way of income. That's, that's the reality of it. We're going to be making World Cups for the next five, five, six World Cups. I did not know that Morgan is a sports psychologist all of a sudden. That's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Arsenal fan clinging on to glory. There we go. So who will he go to? That's the, that's the, that's the question. Uh, will he go to Forge? Will he go to York United? They're on the same national team that we that we faced. I'm gonna guess that Mitrovic didn't watch that game, but if he did, that's that's, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> shocking. <laughs> yeah. Whoever whoever's those soccer fans, they're gonna recognize me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode TFF Plus One. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. It's obviously after that point now, but uh, we're excited to get into it. Uh, we are here with Stefan Mitrovic, player that's playing his football at Radnički Niš in Serbia. Um, Steph, Morgan, what's going on? Hey, guys. just want to say thanks for having me. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Thank hey, you, my friend. No worries, bro. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. We've been excited for this one. been messaging Stefan for a while, so we really appreciate him coming on. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll get straight into it. Stefan, if it's cool, we're just going to do some quick icebreaker questions so that everyone watching gets, you know, a very small gist of kind of who you are. A few fun ones as well there. Um, so we'll just go straight into it. So, Stefan, how old are you? I'm 18. 18 years old. 18. Young. Okay. How yeah. tall are you? I would say I'm 5'11", 6, six foot. Okay, about the same yeah. as me. I'm, I'm right yeah. on that border as well, so I can relate. Um, and so who do you play for at the moment? Jovan did mention it, but give us a little more insight into who you play for, what league they're in. Yeah, so uh, I play for Ranić Kinić in the Serbian Superliga. Uh, Ranić Kinić, we're one of the top top five clubs in Serbia, I would say. So yeah, obviously you've got Belgrade, who are kind of the top teams in that Serbian league. How far do you guys feel like you are from, you know, you know competing with those top teams, getting into Europe and competitions like that? Yeah, I wouldn't say we're too much far off because uh, we believe we could fight with any team here. As I said, um, we beat Partizan like a month ago, so that gives us a lot of confidence going forward. Yeah, 100%. It's important to stay grounded and, you know, yeah. realise you're not there yet, but you want to you wanna push for that. That's the goal. Yeah, definitely. Um, awesome. So then, who do you support as a fan? I support Red Star, Red Star Belgrade. Let's, so okay. you support one of the teams you play against. That's always hard. That's why yeah, they yeah. beat Partizan, you know, because he was, he was uh, giving that energy. Yeah, a funny <laughs> story, actually. I, I made my debut against Red Star, actually, so it was a oh, wow. pretty good that, feeling. That is, yeah. That's nerve-wracking, yeah. That, so, yeah. like, you must idolize those players that you're actually on the pitch against. Yeah, I actually was, yeah. Before, before I came to Serbia, I was watching, I think, almost every Red Star game. So, wow. yeah, it was... Uh, that's an yeah. awesome feeling. So, Jovan's also a Red Star. Um, but on the side, he is also an Arsenal fan. So I do want to know, is there a Premier League club that you support in the background? A Premier League club, I would say Manchester United. Uh -huh. Manchester United. And why, why is that? Why is that, though? Do you have to justify that answer? Um, I would yeah. say Ne Ronaldo is my favorite player. And um, uh -huh. him in those Man U days was like, he was unstoppable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. He, where he you could have warned me he's a Man U fan before we got him on the show, man. You could have warned me. <laughs> so, I need to head up. I need to mentally prepare Mo for these things. Mo Mor Morgan, uh, with that, you know, he's a Leeds fan. So he's uh, obviously supports that, you know, mid of, middle of England slime club uh, that just made its, made its climb in the Premier League. But I think Man United, you'd say, like, I'm an Arsenal fan, obviously, but uh, Man United is also a top club. You have to say that it's doing pretty well this year. Honestly, we were talking about a lot earlier in the podcast that, okay, when's Ali going to get sacked? Uh, what's happening in Man United? This and that. There, I think they were like 13th, 13th, 14th. Well, where where your team are right now, struggling. That is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. I'm not. This is, but, but this is how crazy the Premier League is this year. Like, it just, like, teams can just, you know, a couple wins and teams go from, like, you know, kind of near the bottom to suddenly, like, you know, not far off the kind of the top six, top seven. Yeah. It's crazy. It's a really crazy yeah. league this year. It just goes to show. Um, okay, next question. If you weren't a footballer, what would you probably be doing right now? Not this exact second, but, you know, day-to-day -day life, job-wise. If I wasn't a footballer, I would say to be a tennis player. Tennis? Are you yeah. a quite good tennis player? Yeah, I was, I was actually 
probably as good as soccer when I was younger, playing, balancing tennis and soccer. And then when I was about 11, I had to pick one sport and I, I picked soccer. Fair enough. But, anyway. but I still play well, tennis when I, when I have, like, when I have time. That's, like, probably my best hobby. I reckon I could probably guess your favorite tennis player. <laughs> of course. Give it a shot. Yeah. Is there is there any good is there any good like other Serbian tennis players that could fill in his like fill his shoes when he retires? In the there's some world, young guys say, up and coming. Yeah, yeah, there's some young guys. Yeah. yeah. There's there's a couple. There's a Canadian guy, Shapovalov, isn't it? Shapovalov, he's quite good. Yeah, he's good he's too. Yeah. yeah, he's good. So who who's your kind of favorite footballer or your inspiration? You know, in terms of having someone you look up to and you're like, wow, I'd love to be like that guy. Uh, yeah, so definitely Ronaldo. Ronaldo from the, from a young age, I always looked up to him, my idol. And yeah. Yeah, he does a lot of stuff off the pitch as well that I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for. Yeah, definitely. I would say. Um, okay, and, and we're going to, I'm going to, about five more, I'm going to mix in some non football ones with it as well. So, what's yeah. your favorite food? Like, what's your favorite dish, meal? Dish, I would say chicken wings. Chicken wings. That, chicken wings. Buffalo yeah. Wild Wings. But well, from where? From where exactly? Because I want to know. Question. Yeah, Buffalo Wild Wings is a good buffalo one. Buffalo Wild Wings. That's true. Yeah. Do you have so them for... spicy? Do you like them hot? Yeah, I like like them hot. I like them hot. <laughs> Can't, do that. Can't be doing that. Oh, it's um, not bad. Okay. Okay. So then, dream holiday. What's dream, dream holiday. holiday. Bora Bora. Bora Bora, mate. Bora, Bora. Yeah, that's that's where I want to go for my honeymoon. All I need is a wife now. Um, okay, and then who do you fancy next summer for the Euros? Who's your money on? Obviously, Serbian. I'd say France. 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 Yeah, I'd agree. Everyone has Belgium as like you know the best team in the world, but I just you look at France and the young players they've got coming up as well, like kind of in their late teens, early twenties. It's just ridiculous the talent they have, like kind of twenty to thirty, and then also the young ones coming up. It's just never ending. It's crazy. Definitely. Um, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So Stefan's probably thinking, "What the hell's going on?" I was not ready for those questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah those are a bit of a detail from football there. Um, but I think yeah. it's nice to get to to get to know the person who you're gonna, you know, watch a bit or listen to a bit about uh, before yeah. we get into it. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's let's talk a bit more about you know yourself as a person, as a career. So um, as you said, so tell us a bit about growing up. You mentioned there that you were into tennis as well. So tell us kind of why you decided, uh, I think you said it was at around age 11, you wanted to go into football and just tell us how your journey started from that moment you made that decision. Yeah, so I was balancing tennis and soccer at the same time and uh, it was pretty tough because I really loved both sports. And then one day my dad, my dad asked me, he's like, listen, you gotta, you gotta pick one sport. You can't be playing two for forever so i felt that soccer in my heart is is what i love the most and uh that's why i, I stick with soccer with football awesome. yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's a, like also looking at it from tennis perspective uh that's probably the sport I'm, I'm i'm best at and i play competitively the problem is is uh i think in tennis you look at it in terms of professionally there's only really a hundred hundred players in tennis that are making a living of tennis realistically the yeah. 150 in the world they're not making any money like they're making money sure but they're not really breaking breaking too much far off even right because they have to yeah. travel that's all on them so so that's probably also a strategic uh, decision you made as well because where there's 100 jobs in tennis there's also probably like hundreds of thousands of jobs in, uh, in soccer right and, yeah uh, and the other thing as well you got to think about is probably that most of those tennis players, tennis was their only other sport. I don't think many tennis players were in your position where they had tennis in another sport and they went with tennis. I, f I would imagine that... Fairly, fact most fact check. Players... Fact check right away on Morgan. Fact check. The shocking. Uh, Nadal, I heard, was an amazing soccer player. I think he played at... Uh, I don't want to say because I, I don't know exactly, but he played actually like an academy in, in one of the La Liga teams. I heard that. I heard that too. Um, she was a nasty soccer player. Um, but his uncle was like crazy tennis, and he's also Nadal's top tennis player too. So, but I think also Djokovic is not bad at so, uh, football. I'm not sure, but uh, maybe he's just shit. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I know he played it a little bit. But yeah. It could be shocking. It could be shocking for all I know. So, so yeah, let's get into in terms of you know how you got into the sport. Obviously, you mentioned your dad there. 
um, where you started playing was your first club ever. What did you do? You know, how, when did you realize, oh, yeah, actually, I'm actually pretty good at soccer. Um, let's take this somewhere else. All right, yeah. So I started playing at four years old. Like I said, like my dad, he kind of just took me to, it was like a recreational kind of like house league kind of thing. And then from there, like, I would say like I was like the, the best one, the dom- like the dominant one there. And then from yeah. there, I, I got, I got it, fell in love with it. And then from there, I went to um, Hamilton, Serbia, Hamilton, Serbia. And I played there for about two years and I was playing with my age, uh, years older, two, three years older. And um, I was playing there for two years. And then from there, like, I felt that it was time to, to move on from Hamilton, Serbia. So I went to Softly, Softly at Soccer Club. And I would say Softly Soccer Club, that was probably the best club my age in, in Canada, I would say. And uh, from there, I went to an academy called Juova. And also Juova was a really top academy with the, probably the top players around with great coaching. And uh, from there, I really felt that like, I could really become, really become a player there. And uh, and then from there, from Juvova, I went on a couple of trials that I'll get into. And then uh, what else could I say? Uh, we, I went to after after Juvova Academy. I went to this new so- new soccer league called OPDL, Hamilton United, for a year. And I was only there for one year. And then I I went to Empire Empire Academy, where that's where I played for three years before I went to uh, Serbia. And okay, yeah. so when you moved to like the OPDL, just to get into that a little bit, um, what was the th- what was the thought behind that? Because you probably entered the OPDL when it was pretty early, and, th- and just to give uh, some context to what the OPDL is, the Ontario Player Development League, it's a new. Well, it's it's been here for for a few years now. Ontario Soccer released it to to set a certain standard in the youth football ranks from 13 to 18. Um, so it's almost like a league where you know. There's a certain amount of franchises that could be in that league. So, you know, maintaining a high standard is the goal. And it's very professionalized in the way they operate in terms of uh, having fitness, you know, uh, the, the medical people on the sidelines, um, all the administration stuff, which is also headaches too. That has to be like, I, I can get that, get into that another day where you have to make sure all the people are there. If there's a person that's missing from the sheet, you get fined. If you step out of the technical area, technical area you get fined. The point with that is, how did you find that league and all the promises that it's going to be this top league for Ontario soccer players and actually playing in it? Yeah, so uh, when I went to Hamilton United, that was like the first, the first season of uh, the league. So it was kind of, it was new for everyone. So like, of course, there was some good stuff. There was some bad stuff about it. And, uh, and yeah, so I was playing here there with a year older and OPDL, I feel like, it was probably probably all the best players were playing from each city on that in that league, so I would say the level was level was high. Did you did you feel that you were you were at that level, um, or it was still you know you could still push it further because we we interviewed Tyrese Fauna, who he he plays for Nottingham Forest in the Championship. Uh, we did an interview with him, and he was talking about how he was you know playing for Sunday League, which as he said like your rec leagues where yeah. he just was like, you know, you know, far better. And then when he started playing and trialing at these kind of youth academies, that's when he realized like, oh, wow, look at the standard. Like it's a standard that he really, really had to kind of work for to like stay on top of it. Yeah. And did you feel like with OPDL that you were at that standard, but you had to work really hard to really push your way up or you still felt like you were a bit ahead of some of the talent there? I definitely feel I was a bit better than some of the talent there. So you still felt like one of the strongest players, yeah. you would say? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the OPDL. And then when you were looking for a new challenge, kind of where, where did you think to, to start going? Like, where was the next step for you? And you're like, okay, I'm better than these guys. Where, like, where am I going to go next? So I felt that I was, I was really confident with my game because uh, I was the top goal scorer in the OPDL league. So with that, it gave me a lot of confidence Huge. thinking I could, go, I could go do more. And that was, uh, that was a step where I was – trying to go to Europe because after the age of 16, 15, 16 in Canada, it's, it's not the place you want to be. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. So Serbia, so how good. did that come about? Like going, obviously you have a, you know, a strong Serbian background, um, but where, so how did it all kind of come together? So 
you know, you're sitting there, you're like, I want to, you know, go play in Europe. Obviously, Serbia is a great location because I imagine maybe you have some family there or you've at least been there quite a lot. So you'd feel comfortable there. So it's not like a crazy transition for someone so young. So how, how did you go about trying to like put that all together and, you know, getting awareness or getting discovered? Yeah, more, yeah. So I was going to go with, start with, uh, I first verbally committed to a college because I was, I was 17. I was seventy verbally committed to college, so I was kind of pushing towards the the college because, you know, seventeen. I was I was still trying to push for Europe, but like you have to be re- realistic sometimes at the same time. And uh, I, I I got scouted actually, kind of I wouldn't say lucky, but I felt like it happened for a reason. I was playing in the Canadian Soccer League, the CSL, the with the like the senior squads, and I was doing really good there. And um, an agent, a Serbian agent, he was watching one of our games. And then we got in contact after the game. We got in contact and he was telling me, and he, he had a couple of trials for me lined up in, in Serbia. And so I yeah, definitely want to give that a shot. And uh, so I went to Serbia and the first club I, I was going to was uh, Ranić Kinish. I was going with their, training with their first team. And so I was there for about a week. And right away, they wanted to sign me. I was just training with them. I had a friendly with the inner squad actually. So I didn't, I didn't sign yet, but I was playing games with the U19s. So I played a few games with the U19s. They registered me and stuff. And uh, I was doing really well. I scored, scored three goals in three games. Mm-hmm. And from there, from there the, I was put on the bench um, with the first team. It was, it was funny because I didn't even have a contract and they put me on the, on the bench with the first team. That's so Serbian. <laughs> Superliga yeah, Serbia. Ling Long yeah. Superliga. That's jokes. That's sick though. Yeah. So what was that so, feeling like? Because it's so different, obviously, to being in Canada and being like that top player. Now you're like playing real football, serious stuff with lots of fans, lots of following. Was that a bit surreal at first? Uh, not really, because uh, I felt I was, I was built for that. So, so when I came there, I, was, I, wanted to, I wanted to show myself and I know I could do that. So that's what I did. Yeah. That's amazing, man. I, I'll, we're going to get into maybe the, the trial part and stuff. Maybe it prepared you for that. But obviously yeah. the fact that the familiarity with, with, with Serbia and, and it almost was perfect, that fact that, let's be honest, there's a lot of players that, you know, from this area that have, that have went to Serbia and they, they've done good things. But, but the fact that Radnic Kinis is not like the same as, it's one of the biggest clubs in Serbia in terms of history, in terms of, Niche being in the city of Serbia is the third largest, I think, in Serbia. So the fact that you were able to sign for a club like that, start against, start against Zvezda, which all, all of us in Hamilton and, and, and all Serbs, I guess, in this area were so proud of when they saw that. Who'd you score against Rad? Was it Rad? From- Scored against Rad, yeah. Yeah, so a team just from the, basically in Belgrade, you would say, but it might be the outskirts of Belgrade, Rad. But uh, the fact that you were able to do that is, is, is amazing. So what... What at what point did you feel okay? You know, I'm in a I'm in a maybe a city that I'm not really familiar for familiar with. Um, you know, all these other players, they're born, they're they also they're raised in Serbia. Maybe it's a little bit different in terms of that. But when did you feel comfortable? Like, hey, yeah, I belong in this team. I'm, uh, you know, this is just a start for me. Yeah, so I would say right after I made my debut, I I signed the contract and. Um... I was I was just giving him giving him my all. I was training hard and um, I was always pushing to because of course coming in there you have to fight for a spot being one of the youngest there. But even though I was one of the youngest, I wanted to show and prove that I could play. I could I could I could start. You know, so so that's what I was trying to do. And uh, and yeah, so uh, during the season, some games I'd play, some games I'd come off the bench, some games I would start. But I'm now I'm trying to be like a be a starter for like for the, for the season. So. No one can take that spot for me. Yeah, and while we're in it, like, let's talk. About, yeah, you have a, you have a top mentality. You, you you know, I think the question before, um, and uh, when when you asked, you know, how was it with all the fans and whatnot, and like uh, the atmosphere, and the fact that you can you can you know say that's you know not, I was born for that, I was ready for that is is important. So I think yeah, the mental the part is huge. Using yeah, using the yeah. fans to feed you rather than like scare you. Or, or put you down or make you more nervous. Using that as energy to help boost you is like, if you can just mentally do that, that's such a huge part of football, I feel. Definitely, because so, my first game, there was 15,000 in the stadium. So, and that's probably like 
you know, that's probably one of the, like, the most in the, you're going to have in the Superliga, you know, so, so it was, it was kind of like an icebreaker for me, which I felt like could play anywhere after, after that, you know. Yeah, yeah. in the yeah. Serbian atmosphere. That's a good point. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure the atmosphere is not exactly the most, uh, like, how is it in the, uh, niche in terms of the, the people and the atmosphere? Oh uh, sure yeah, there's a, there's definitely a culture, a uh, soccer culture in niche. Uh, like a lot of people like it, but I would say, with the fans wise, uh, if it's a big, if it's a bigger team, more fans will come out. But if we're playing one of these lower teams, it's not it's not as much, you know. So while we're on the topic, obviously of the new, well, you could call it new Linglong Superliga. Uh, typically, you know, when you look at a country with seven million people. It's also known for producing top footballers, a footballing nation, you would call it. Um, even still, I think 20 teams is, 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 is maybe eight more than you need. Um, you look at Croatia. Croatia has, I think they have 10 teams. I could be wrong. They might have 12. Uh, Bosnia also around that number. Uh, and then you have Serbia with 20 teams. So how do you look at that? Um, what's your thoughts? Is that is that okay for you as a player? You get to play a, a big variety of teams. Uh, you know, you get 38 matches, like you're kind of replicating the top five leagues in the world. What's your thoughts on that? I, I like it. I like the 20 teams. You know, when you look at these top leagues, most most of these top leagues have 20 teams, like like you said, those top five leagues. It gives you a variety of, of different squads. And then, yeah, I, I feel like it's it's good. You know, there's a, it gives you actually more for players more more chance of you getting into the to the superliga definitely and and just to bridge off that question then uh, obviously since since the rise of Zvezda lately Red Star Belgrade and Partizan also contributing quite heavily to the to the UEFA coefficient for the country we've basically reached the 16th in Europe in terms of league so our league is ranked the 16th best league in Europe which is not bad obviously we know at the 15th if you're the 15th and higher you have two plus teams in the chip uh, that go to the Champions League qualif qualification. So, what it means now is there's a third tier competition called the UEFA Conference League that is going to be starting, I think, next year. Uh, so, what does that mean? Though, I guess the idea there is to to allow for teams maybe in the profile of Radnich Kanish to maybe be able to to compete in Europe. Do you think that that's the next step for clubs like uh, Vojvodina, uh, Chukarički? Uh, obviously, Radnički. Like, is this the next step for them to compete in Europe? Is that the ambition, obviously, of the club? Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's always the ambition to to play in Europe for the clubs like Radnički and those clubs that you said, Vojno Chukarički, because because of the season, you're always pushing to be in the in the top. Because you know you got Zvezdarđi and you know you call those the powerhouses in the league. So those third and fourth place teams are is really really tight, really competitive. Try to fight for the, those Europe spots because that's what yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah. To showcase just, yourself uh, in different different part of the Europe. Yeah, yeah for sure. Go on, for a player, know. for a player as well. I mean, for yourself, you want to play in Europe as much as the as much as the club does for obviously financial reasons, and and, the, and obviously the fans. The fans want to, you know, there was days where uh, more than more than the two uh, Belgrade clubs were playing in Europe. So hopefully that can happen again. Um, another thing I think that it's maybe at the disadvantage of our clubs. Uh, in a lot of clubs from the, you know, uh, you would call it East, uh, Eastern Europe, is that you, in terms of qualifying for Europe, your league maybe starts at the beginning of August. Um, however, the, the Champions League or Euro Europa League and this new Conference League, the qualifications start in June. So as your league finishes in May sometime, then you have next to no time for, for recovery and for a break maybe, and then you have to be competing at top level because let's be honest, I think to qualify for Europe, you're going to be have, to have to be at premium level. So going off a long season, 38 games, you know, um, and then having to compete and beat teams that are maybe have a little bit more rest than you that are, you know, that enter the competition of the third qualifying round, whereas teams like from, from Serbia, they have to start from the first qualifying round. What do you think about that? Like, is that obviously that's a disadvantage? Uh, because you have to get the prime level at the start of the season, even before the season. Whereas some teams, like uh, teams from England, Portugal, this and that, they have some games to play. Then they have that playoff round to to, to qualify for. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, it's a disadvantage, of course. 
finishing finishing in June because at the always at the end of the season, those last couple of games, you know, the fatigue gets at you. But I mean, I think it's it's mentally because when you look at these, the Premier League, they have I would say like no breaks, yes. and they're and they're and they're going, they're playing insanely that throughout the whole season and going playing high level in Champions League, the where it matters and the, cup the most. Competitions as well, the domestic yes. cup competitions and cups, cups too. Yeah, so I feel like you just got to be like I think mentally, mentally stronger than than what you what you have to be. Let's put the English a- accent on. So this guy is set for one fall between Morgan and Stefan here. So we start always from the goal, if I'm not mistaken. So right now the ball is Stefan, with yeah. Stefan's meet, uh, goalkeeper and he has three options. Will he play it out to his left fullback, uh, centrally to his center backs or um, on the right flank? So he has three options. Um, Steph, so we got the answer in terms of the pressing from Morgan. You have three options. Let us know where you're going to go. I'm going to start off with playing with my center back, my left center back. Well, it has ended in catastrophe right away as Stefan plays it to his center backs. But Morgan <laughs> guesses right and presses. And now we have a chance for an interception. Well, so what happens now is that... Um, Mitrovic, you're going to have to answer a question correctly to keep the ball. All right. Um, All right. And let's try this question. So, Danny Invincible, Kevin Unstoppable, and Liam Indestructible, Indestructible were all professional footballers. True or false? And I'm going to tell you again the names. Danny Invincible, Kevin Unstoppable, and Liam Indestruct- Indestructible we're all professional footballers. That's a true or false question. Um, you know, let's see. Where are we at? I would say false. And he guesses correctly. And Stefan uh, <laughs> retains possession of the ball. And we'll have another chance. So, what this means then is your ball, the center back wins the ball. Now he has, obviously, three, three more options. He can play out to his, his uh, left midfield, play centrally again to the uh, central midfielder, or he can play the right midfielder. So, let's see what Morgan's going to press. Uh, Steph, take it away. What's the what's the answer there? I'm I'm putting a driven pass to my right, my left winger. Oh, okay. Well, that was a close one. He thought about to disguise the pass to his right midfielder, and he goes into the left midfield. Luckily, Morgan gets it all wrong and presses his left side so what that means is the ball goes out to the right midfielder uh nice disguise there from Steph as he mentioned right there and I was like ah okay but then he said left so it's perfect he continues <laughs> possession of the ball so Steph you have three options again you can switch the field um to obviously the right winger you could play up like st- straight to your uh left winger or you could play into your striker centrally uh three options you're probably going to get the gist of the game now but, uh, yeah, what's your answer? I'm going to go up to my center forward. I'm going to give him a ball to feet. A ball to the feet of the central forward. Very well stopped by the, def- the defense from Morgan. And what that means oh, is there's a chance for Morgan to take the ball this time as he gets the right way. So, question. Who scored the longest distance Premier League goal ever? Premier League goal is the is the highlight under there. So who scored the longest distance Premier League goal? Was it A, Paul Robinson, E, Tim Howard, or F, David Beckham? Tim Howard. Boom. No, no and he retains – and I want to – okay, so justify the answer because it's correct, obviously. Um, and – that's impressive. Is it? Is it because he's a goalkeeper? Is that why you said it? Or do you remember the goal? Yeah, I actually watched. I actually watched that game where, where he scored <laughs> that. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. That was a crazy goal. Yeah. Well, yeah, because Robinson we- scored for Leeds, right? But that wasn't the long distance one. That was the header. He scored. Uh, Paul Robinson scored a header from a corner against Swindon in the cup to win the game. That was crazy. That was like added time as well. Like 92nd, 93rd minute. Corbison came up. Gorgeous header as well. Crazy. 
I'm gonna guess that Mitrovic didn't watch that game, but if he did, that's that's, uh, <laughs> no. that's shocking. That, yeah. Well, so the central center forward has the ball at his feet. Uh, it's a shooting chance, and it's bi- very simple. It's uh, if you answer the question correctly, which you've been pretty good so far, two for two, and you'll score the first goal. Um, so let's give this question. So. A chance to score the opening goal. It's so it's so far. It's, there's been some shaky moments where you almost lost the ball in your in your third in your defensive third, and then obviously the final third. Uh, but you answered the two questions swiftly, no problem. Uh, who has made the most Premier League appearances? We have three options for you. So the most Premier League appearances: uh, A. Frank Lampard, B. Gareth Barry, or G. Ryan Giggs. The question is, again, who made the most Premier League appearances? Uh, A, Frank Lampard, B, Gareth Barry, or C, Ryan Giggs? Giggsy. A chance for the opening Uh, goal in this game. We will see where he goes with this. It's between Barry and Giggs. Uh, I'm going with Giggsy. He absolutely rips the shot and it hits the crossbar and will just go over the line. That was a close one, man. You couldn't have got any closer than that. It is Gareth Barry with 653 appearances. That's a close call for Morgan. Um, and that's a very close call in, in, in terms of uh, scoring the first goal of the game. This game is not meant to be easy. I just had a quick question, like interesting thought. Uh, I mean, Jovan can chime in as well, definitely. So, as you said, um, obviously there's there's 20 teams um, now in the, the Serbian league, and how do you feel? Obviously, you've got the two top teams in Zvezda and Partizan, but below that, what's the competition like? As you said, there's quite competitive for those third, fourth places, but when you look at the league as a whole, how competitive is it? Or with 20 teams, do you feel like there's maybe like five, six teams you play where? you feel that you're confident you're going to get quite an easy win. It's more of a question of like how much you're going to win by. And then I have a follow-up based on your guys' answers. Yeah, I would say besides those top two, top two, three teams in the league, everyone, everyone can play with anyone. So there's not one game where you're, you're thinking, okay, this is going to be an easy win, you know, where we're all relaxed. It, every, game's, every game's tough. Every game's really tough. And hard to predict, would you say? Like, so yeah. any team on their day can, could win it. Rather Definitely. than like, I think La Liga's improved their level, but there was a time when Liga, maybe other leagues, like maybe the Portuguese league, where there's just a, quite a huge gap between, you know, the top and the bottom. So yeah. I think it's a, it's an interesting thing. But do you think um, would m- reducing, and the Jovan kind of touched on this before, but maybe cutting it in half and doing two leagues of 10 teams, just make it a bit more competitive in terms of teams going up, teams going down. Do you think that's something that could make it more interesting or you, or you like it as it is with the 20 teams in the league? I, I like it as well with, with the 10-10. It's going to be more competitive, you know, because uh, right now, actually, since we have 20 teams this season, six clubs are getting relegated. So it's yeah. really a battle, wow. really a battle at the bottom, bottom half of the league. So it's, it's interesting. And I'm just going to uh, touch on that point. So, I could be wrong, and you never know with the FSS, the Football Association of Serbia, because they're 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 a different conversation. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but from my understanding, is they have made the uh, the first uh, so Superliga, the the top tier of Serbian football this year, twenty teams. Usually it's sixteen. Last year sixteen, prior year sixteen. So far it's been like that. Uh, now it's twenty teams. And then the sec- the Prva Liga, which is first league, which is actually is the second tier, if it's not uh, it's confusing enough. It's basically the same as the, uh, how England has it. Uh, but that's 18 teams, I believe, this year. So they've increased the number of the leagues that are typically 16 and 16. They've increased that by uh, six teams. And I believe they've done this for financial reasons because of coronavirus. I could be wrong. And I think the reason was that they want – because once you're outside of the top two leagues – you're no longer considered a professional team. You are playing in the regional leagues, the, the North, uh, Vojvodina Liga, uh, Srpska Liga, uh, Shumadija Liga, like, which is the central of Serbia, and then obviously the, the south of Serbia, um, which is more where Steph is, is based. He's based in the southern part of Serbia, you would say. Um, 
but the point is that they've increased the numbers. So they have more teams that are considered professional. Maybe, I don't know if there's anything financial in that, but um, Steph mentioned it. I think six teams is getting relegated. So what that means is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a really big fight at the bottom for teams. Uh, and it's, it's probably meaning that a, a lot of pressure for, for, for managers that, you know, even if you're a massive team like Radnički Kinish or a massive team like, you know, you could say uh, Čukarički, Vojdina is, is, is very good this year. But, like, I'm thinking even teams like Vojdovac, like teams that typically you don't think are going to be in the bot- bottom tiers of the league. If there's six teams that could be relegated, so you never know. Um, how does that then translate into this 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 year, Steph? Do you feel the pressure? Um, obviously, your team is sitting, I think, seventh in the table, somewhere like that. Uh, so that's obviously pretty pretty healthy. But then it's a matter of points, and then you, you know a few few bad results, and you could be in a little bit of pressure. How have you felt that extra pressure from yourself, maybe from the the managers? Uh, you could kind of look at the managers, yeah. the, the turnover of managers this year, and maybe that has anything to do with it. Definitely, I would say with these twenty teams now, every game is is really important. With one one slip up, you could you could go down two three spots, and uh, I've, I wouldn't say funny story, but I would say I've, I've been in the running for one year, and this is I have four, this is my fourth coach now, in one year. That's so that's so it yeah so it's it's tough. So like you lose one game, you could go down and they could hit you hard. So every game you got to be at the top of your game and. and you know, you can't let those slip ups go. You know. Yeah, I think and, it's I, I think an interesting conversation. Just the the idea of having like two leagues with ten teams, and just making like obviously you'd have less fixtures in the regular season, but maybe make throwing in some more exciting kind of maybe sort of postseason type things in there. So like well, obviously we talked about we've had an idea that we spoke about like relegation playouts, which are a bit like playoffs, but instead like you're you're battling to win a game to basically stay up. So if you lose, you go through to the final and then you basically want to just avoid losing those games. Otherwise you go down. So like if you had like, say, let's say five teams go down, five teams go up and doing something where like, you've got like three immediately go down and then a group of four playing like a play out where one extra goes down and even having one above them to play like a team in the second league, second league and they have like one match against each other to like determine whether one stays or one goes up like an outside shot sort of thing, having a playoffs in the second league, all these sorts of things. I think it can make a really exciting revenue. As you said, get more fans in for these really pivotal games. Um, Because sometimes obviously you said like there's smaller attendances for the regular season games. So if you maybe reduce the number of regular season games, but increase kind of the importance of some of the other games or just more tense games, I think that would help bring fans in as well. I think I agree with you. I agree with you. I think I look at it from a few different aspects. I think in the end of the day, and 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 uh, luckily having the, you know, privilege to talk with some people from the Croatian FA as well uh, through doing my coaching courses and talking about how they've managed to, then like also Serbia, there's also a great a great country for producing players, and it's evident in terms of the results. Serbia has a great national team in terms of players playing out in the in the big top five leagues. Also does Croatia. Um, but one difference is obviously is their league size and they send in terms of the, the quality of teams. So you have a fewer amount of teams that play regularly against each other. And uh, the idea is that they have more of their top premium players condensed and they're playing each other more often, which then in theory rises the development and, and, and increases the efficiency of the development with that, the players. I think, you know, there's, there's, there's two different ways of looking at it, but for Serbia, where, you know, how, how many leagues can you have and call it professional? It's not like England mm. where you can have four, four professional leagues. It's, you know, you can only really get away with having maybe two, I think. And that's pretty standard for, for most leagues. Maybe you could have a third one. Um, but at the end of the day, I've always been an advocate for, for fewer teams, uh, for maybe a few more leagues. But also what Serbia has done in the past is with their 18 team or 16 team league, they've split it in half. So after 30, so they have, they have 16 teams after 30 games, which is a home and away, they split the league in half. So the eight top teams, which is a playoff round, or, uh, and then there's the play down round. So basically what it is, it's an extra round against the teams that are in your area, which makes it, for, for Serbian fans at least, what, much more competitive. Because, and what they also do is they also divide the points in half. So if Zvezda had a 10-point lead, 
um, after 30 games. Well, now they only have five point league because they divide all your points by two. So, so then the league is very important. Then you're playing Partizan, you're playing uh, Radnički, you're playing Vo- uh, Vojvodina. So then that gap with five points becomes very, you know, very, uh, you know, less than five points. Let's put it that way. So it makes yeah. it more competitive. Though I think something that you could do, you can even do with a 12 team league because I've seen it in Scotland. They do with 12 teams. They do the same thing after 33 games. They play that last thing. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, this is another conversation in its own. I want to see what uh, Steph's thoughts are on this. And I think maybe looking at it too naively uh, in, in from someone that's not really in this battleground right now, I think the future of, 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 of football, and I think Serbs, Croatians, uh, this Balkan area do it very well in terms of developing players. They have to unite at some, at, at some stage. And I don't mean a, re- a regional mm-hmm. league, a Balkan league that has, you know, eight of the top superpowers in, in, in the Balkan region. I don't think that's good for our football because our football is more than just Vezda Partizan. We're talking to a player that playing Radnički that is a club that also has developed a lot of good players. So I don't, I don't think an exclusive regional league would be the... Uh, but just bringing it all together. I, I don't so even know about that. Close, so you could, but you're saying like, you know, bring it all together in terms of like a, a league where all the, there's no such thing as an isolated, maybe at a lower level, but like a a league for the one country, but bring it all together and have like a league that's just more competitive because you've got just a bigger abundance of teams in there, more top level teams. Um, obviously like teams like Dynamo Zagreb, teams like that, throw them in there and get more kind of elite competition in that top league, have more of a premier league sort of status by kind of bringing countries together. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, that's, that's where I'm going. And obviously I'm really eager to see what Steph's thoughts are on that. And, 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 and I've heard people's thoughts in Serbia about it. The fans don't want that. That's for sure. The fans really don't want that um, because of the political things. And the, they really don't want that. But if you look at also in basketball, what they've done, it's called the ABBA Liga, which is the, one of the best leagues for basketball in the world. Okay, you have NBA, you have all this stuff. But ABBA Liga is a top league. That's the whole ex-Yugoslavia region in there. And um, the, the only issue is you have to look at the other teams in Serbia. You can't just look at one, two, three and say, that's fine. You, I would do personally, I wouldn't mix anything until the later stages in the season. So I would say, okay, the top four teams in Serbia, they go and play a knockout stage tournament or maybe a small league tournament with the top four and all the other Balkan leagues. Because at some point you want more of a competition. I would love to yeah. see Zvezda play Dinamo Zagreb uh, because I think in the end of the day, those are big matches. And I don't, I don't look at it in terms of the political part, I look at it in terms of development part for our league and our players and what is a massive match in terms of also financial too. But uh, so, Steph, what's your thoughts? Yeah. That's a huge pack question. Wait, just yeah. so I know, yeah, so what you're saying is that you're saying like the, the domestic league is like a group stage or like a kind of regular season that is important to then get into like this postseason kind of like the final yes. competition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to start with that. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, so every, I, I think – only last year they didn't they didn't split those points in half because of I think it was because of Corona because of Corona, yes. the COVID, but um, I think everybody except Red Star Partizan like that like that rule because it gives you definitely a, it gives you a <laughs> chance to to battle yeah. and fight fight back for a spot because once Vez is ahead by a lot it, you can't you can't catch him you know what I mean so like now since it's split in half it really gives you it gives you more motivation more, more motivation and. Uh, you know, you're, you're hungry. You're hungry to to try to try to beat them. You know, because those are the games you kind of play for. And I was gonna talk about the development part uh, in Serbia with these players. It's um, most clubs here in Serbia they they rely on producing, developing players to sell them. Because that I would say that's the only way of income. Income for that's where that that's how clubs make a living here. So so I feel like all these clubs are trying to. They always have some kind of these young players trying to develop. To of course sell them in, in the future to to make some money off them because without that the this league wouldn't wouldn't exist. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's a great point. What what is it like playing in what you might call not in terms of number of teams maybe the the quality the level the fans and what you might describe especially in Europe as a, a smaller league. So obviously you've got your top five. And then you've got five to 15, which like I think Serbia are now trying to break into. And as Jovan's kind of mentioned with the coefficient, they're, they're almost there. But a smaller league where 
you know, as you said, you get games where, you know, the stadium feels a bit, you know, half empty or home games where when you play the road, those really big teams, you find that like a lot of the fans aren't necessarily your fans and they're supporting another team. Um, I can somewhat relate, you know, with Leeds when I don't know how much you know about the history of Leeds, but the last kind of 15 years we've been like in the lower leagues, we've gone down to League One, which is the third division in England. Yeah. So we've shelled And at these times, like I was going to games where we, you know, we have a 37 and a half thousand stadium. It was maybe 15, 20,000 max. So, you know, it can feel half empty at times because it literally is. Um, so do you find that in any way can be like a bit demotivating or thinking like, I want something better, like this is, um, you know, this is okay, but I, I really want to strive for greatness or like, or is it something that doesn't bother you too much and you just kind of play your game? Uh, I would say I play my game, but uh, of course, I think for most players, fans is what, is what makes, makes you kind of play. You know, it's, uh, it's like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like when there's, when there's no fans, like right now we could do to COVID, it's, it's, it's a way different feeling than having fans, having, hearing noise, hearing like f- flares, explosions, something, you know what I mean? Like going on. So, so yeah. yeah. So when I played that first game against Red Star, like I've never witnessed like flares, bought, like explosions going on, like what's going on. You know what I mean? Like you're playing and you're hearing these noises in the, in the stadium is just like a surreal feeling you it's indescribable yeah it's it, that's crazy and it, it's like i guess touch on this a bit and, and how you really feel it affects you without fans either just like as you said some games where you just never got fans because of the team you're playing or other games where um where you, obviously now covid's happened that you just don't have any fans there and there was a study that was done i can't remember who did the study but it looked into um a certain chemical that is produced due to adrenaline and things like that. Um, and they measured that the levels were like, I think it was in the Bundesliga, that the levels were like, you know, I think 60, 70% lower than what they were when the fans were there. And that's a lot of, and this chemical you rely a lot on for energy and things like that. It is. So it, yeah. it scientifically shows that it, there is a difference of not having fans and it does impact the player. And you can feel it watching it. The game feels a bit more lethargic and there's not that same motivation, you know, when you're 1-0 down at home and the fans drive you on that. It's not that same feeling like so how do you feel like or what are the biggest impacts it has on you personally i would say personally as well uh yeah with those fans it gives it gives me that extra energy that boost that without without those fans it doesn't you know as you said adrenaline all that kicks in and that definitely boosts your boost your energy in in your game you know and would you say like um hopefully i'm touching on the right thing here but i would imagine that that's the biggest impact of that is those last 15, 20 minutes when, you know, you've run for over an hour, you know, God knows how far you've been running your total kind of distance, but you're, you know, you're getting pretty knackered. You've made three subs and you've, you're drawing, but you need to win this game. I think that I would imagine that is when, you know, that makes the biggest difference. And then you really need the fans. Would you feel that, that, or is it just like beginning to end? It's just not the same or like those last 20 minutes when you're like, Oh, I could use some extra energy here. Those last twenty minutes, yeah, like that. That's what uh, definitely is the the best part. You know, you need you need you yeah. need someone like those fans to to help you help you go through the those last fifteen twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. I did not know. I did not know that Morgan is a sports psychologist. All of a sudden, that's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> good job, man. But uh, yeah, but no, it's a good point. I think. Uh, it is what it is, but hopefully by by next season, um, you know, you'll have – and probably if, if I was to put my money on any league to have fans back in the stadium uh, as soon as possible, I'd put Serbian League because I remember in the middle of the – was it June or – might have been June where uh, Vucic gave uh, the go-ahead for the derby to be to be played with full fans, I think. Was there yeah, 20,000 fans or 30,000 fans? So – Zvezda was playing Partizan with a full crowd in the middle of a pandemic. In that, in that, that definitely uh, sounded Serbia. alarm bells. Sounded <laughs> alarm bells. I got some buddies <laughs> from Germany and from Netherlands that were like, "Man, you guys are crazy." But yeah, that's sometimes in theory you, you look back and what what is that going to mean for the derby when you know during the pandemic, during the whatever biggest pandemic in the in the recent history, uh, Vucic gave. Uh, the go-ahead for the biggest derby in the world to be played. So, 
that's uh that's where we go from there what's it like the city you're living in is it do you enjoy it is it a nice city yeah it's a nice city nice city niches like how uh, how like Johan said uh probably one of the nicest cities in Serbia it's one of the biggest as well and yeah. it's also there's also soccer culture in there like I said so it's it's good it's good nice. do you find that like you're treated a bit like a celebrity in in the city do you find that or could you just go to a restaurant with like uh, with friends or family and like no one would like know you're there and you're just kind of chilling? uh it depends it depends because of course whoever whoever's those soccer fans of course they're gonna recognize me but whoever yeah. doesn't really play with doesn't really watch soccer like keep keep follow it and yeah it's it's fine <laughs> Yeah, so like yeah. you have had people come up to you for pictures, autographs, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 pictures. So cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah. then like, what about the clubs? Any VIP experiences at the clubs? You walk in straight to VIP. Uh, no, well, not, not right really. now. I guess COVID, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, not really. It will come. It will come. Who knows? Yeah, one day. One yeah. day. Um, I'm thinking. So we we'll jump back to the game, and then we can transfer and talk about Canadian soccer a bit. Yeah, yeah. sure. So, so awesome. The no-name football game, nil-nil, and Morgan has the ball in his uh, from his goalkeeper. Okay, uh, yeah, all you stuff. I'm gonna press center. So the press is is set centrally. However, Morgan plays out to his left, so the left back is on the ball. Um, Steph got it all wrong in that case. So. Next one we go, uh, the left back, as, as, as we said, has the ball. Uh, Morgan, you have three options. You've already given your decision. Um, Steph, where are you pressing, mate? I'm pressing his, his left winger. Oh, there we go. Well, you won the ball, uh, but have you? So uh, you, you, cho- you chose the right way. Obviously, the left, left, uh, left back played up to his left winger. However... Steph got it all right, and uh, he pressed the right, his right side, the, le- the left winger. So, um, in order to, re- like, to actually steal the ball, to win the ball, you're going to have to answer this question correctly. We have this question. What does RB stand for in Leipzig? We have A, Red Bull. We have B, ra- Razor Blade. And we have C, <laughs> Rasenball Sport. So, again, A, Red Bull. B, razor blade, or C, razor ball sport? Red Bull. Unfortunately, Morgan retains possession as the answer was razor ball sport, Leipzig. Um, and the reason why it's called razor oh, ball sport, Leipzig, is because um, teams in Germany cannot have company corporate names in their. In their uh, so they just yeah, call it Yeah, there's a massive sport. like court case about Huge it. Everyone court assumes case, Red Bull because yeah. Red Bull own them. But. Yeah. Obviously, Red Bull being smart, like they wanted people to still think that it stood for Red Bull. So most people, and I only learned this when I was kind of like putting questions together, that they still want people to think Red Bull because Red Bull yeah. own the com- own the teams, but technically they're actually called the Razzle Bull Sport. Yeah, well, um, it's obviously working. So, so um, yeah, left left wing has the ball. Uh, yeah, three options. Steph, what's your uh, what's the decision, mate? Uh, we're gonna press the. I'm gonna go for the the center forward. Mm. Well, compact. <laughs> Stefan Mitrovic goes in in make sure the center uh, the center forward is cut off. However, the ball is switched all the way over to the right forward, the right winger. So we have a chance now for potentially a goal. So there's a question I'm gonna ask you. If you answer it correctly. You win the ball back, and you don't concede. It's a goal kick. If you answered it, if you don't answer it correctly, well, Morgan will score the first goal of the night. Let's uh, let's look at this question. When talking about f- how much his wife doesn't like football, which footballer said the following? One day she called me ten minutes before a game to find out where I was. So that's basically, you know. Again, okay. what? So you understand the question, and yeah. then it goes. There's three options. There's A, Peter Crouch, B, Jermaine, or C, Rio Ferdinand. Peter Crouch. Oh, jeez, that's a mumbleable. A shot for Morgan. 
goes in. A great save for the keeper. And it goes off the bar. And it will be a goal kick. We Should we play another round? Should we play another round of it? Because Yeah, let's see if Stefan can uh, yeah. get another shot and go. Okay, so the ball's from the goalkeeper. Steph, you have three options, obviously. Left full back, right full back, or central. I'm going right back. Right back, and it is easily played. Morgan gets it all wrong, and it will be to the right back of Stefan Mitrovic's um, team. Uh, yeah, three options. Uh, up to the right wing. I'm playing up to the right wing. And again... The defense is shambles from Morgan, and the ball will go to the right midfield. Um, and we have another question. I, I obviously, I guess, you know, you play it to the right forward, the left forward, or the center forward. Uh, three options. I'm switching to my left forward. <sighs> and Stone does the pitch. This is a cu- counter attack and a half because you've just absolutely destroyed it and switched it. Again, the Morgan's team is too central, they're not playing the width at all. And uh, yeah, so so the ball is now with the left, the left uh, forward, and now there we have another scoring chance, and this scoring chance will be an interesting one. Hopefully, you can get this correct. Okay, so a massive counter attack. All has to be done is now clinically finished. In 2008, 19 year old Theo Walcott became the youngest player to score an England hat trick, breaking a 125 year record set by Clement Mitchell in 1883. But who was it against? So, again, in 2008, Theo Wilcott, oh, the youngest player, scored an England hat-trick. We have three options. We have A, Hungary, B, Serbia, D, Croatia. Sorry, C, Croatia. So, again, Theo Wilcott Against what country? Trick. Yeah, so was it Hungary, Serbia, or Hrvatska? Uh, man. In 2008. Well, do you remember the game? Do you remember the game? I, I remember yeah, what was it. it was this for the... It was for the... Was this for the Euros or... I think World I think Cup qualifying. Euros. Was it World oh, Cup? Oh, no. Was, I I World Cup qualifying, I think. I'm pretty sure the score was 4-1. Am I right, Jovan? I think I remember I this game, 4-1. yeah. 4-1. But I'm I don't remember with... it too well. Oh, man. I'm going with... Krish. An absolute razor blade of a shot will go into the top corner. 1-0 to Stefan Mitrovic. Croatia, yeah, yeah, I remember that game. It was the, They were in the same group for World Cup qualifying. I don't really remember exactly, but I remember them being in the same group. So Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, that was a close one. You, you definitely know it's not Serbia, so that helped you out a little bit. Um, yeah, of course. So, 1-0. Let's get back into it. Let's talk a little bit about Canadian football. Obviously, um, since, you know, you were a part of the whole Canadian Premier League uh, coming to effect, um, that came into effect 2019, obviously with the inaugural seven teams, now eight teams, uh, Canada's only professional league that, that ranges from coast to coast. Atletico Ottawa. Yeah, we have Atletico Ottawa. We have all these teams. Uh, what's your outlook on it? Like, what's your, obviously, you know, you went through the whole process there. Obviously, you must think it's a it's a good thing, but but how do you look at the Canadian Premier League and where it could go? Yeah, I look at it as probably the best thing can, Canadian soccer could have done is have their own league because we we don't have a league and uh, well, twenty twenty six are hosting a World Cup and like having no, not having a league that's yeah. kind of like shocking. <laughs> that's right? shocking. Yeah, that's shocking for sure. <laughs> yeah, so I mean that's definitely the the best that we could have done and and yeah, it's I think this is the third second year I think of the CPO or the third yeah. is coming up. Third coming up, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you could tell it's it's getting better every year. You know what I mean? And I feel like in ten years, this could be it's could be a good strong league. Like, look at the MLS, how where it came from. Yeah, you know, yeah. MLS is one of like I wouldn't after like the top five leagues, they're they're up there. You know what I mean? Yes. yes you think yeah. you can draw the same attention as as the MLS has because it's yeah. just had you know huge injections. You look at Beckham, you know, buying in um, other teams as well. Do you, can you can you see that sort of attention coming to the Canadian Premier League? Maybe people like Drake, you know, investing um, in soccer and helping it grow to to kind of a higher level. Obviously, we're just starting off, but yeah, yeah I, th- I definitely think so. Yeah, because when you look at when the MLS first started, I don't think there was too many fans at, at the games either. Because uh, with the CPL, like I wouldn't say 
it's it's not full stadiums yet, you know, like you know, but uh, but look at it now, it's every stadium full, full stadium, thirty plus thousand. And yeah. uh, I and I feel like the CPL can can definitely do that as well. Yeah. Would you ever? Is there something? Obviously, I think um, Europe's obviously a different gravy. But um, could you see yourself playing in the CPL at all? In the future, yeah. Why not? Why not? There we go. So who will he go to? That's the, that's the, that's the question. Uh, will he go to Forge? Will he go to York United? Just obviously talking about the CPL. Um, I was going to ask, kind of, what do you see as the the vision for the CPL? Is it to bring a higher, you know, quality or level to Canada in terms of soccer? Or is it more to kind of nurture Canadian talent and help them then, you know, go as a kind of a starting point to then jump up, as you said, to places like Europe, as such as yourself um, and so forth, whilst, you know, simultaneously trying to increase the level um, within Canada, within that league? Yeah, so I think with this this league, it's definitely for the Canadian players to. It gives you another chance to to go pro and to try to make a career out of yourself, because with, without this league, there is only Toronto FC that's kind of in the area, and Ontario, or like, or in general, and there's only three clubs in in Canada that are professional, and that's I would say that's like, that's kind of crazy yeah. to think about. Yeah. Out of yeah. entire Canada, only three professional clubs. Well, not with this league, it gives. It gives young players hope, and um, you know they believe to go, you know, to go to CPL, and from the CPL make a career. Because yeah, you could. You, there's a few players already that I'm that I'm really good friends with, that uh, from the CPL they went on to go abroad already. You know what I mean? So yeah, there's a guy Emilio Estevez. He played on York. Now he's in Ado de Hang in Holland. Mm. You know, and you got Tristan Borges as well. He he's in Belgium now. You know, so like. From and almost also the national team, he got a call from the national team from the CPL. So, you know, you look at those kind of stuff, and that that pushes you to you know, to try to do the same. You know. Yeah, and I think what's good about the CPL as well is the the timing of when the league starts um, and finishes, or just the time period it's played in. It allows players opportunity in the off season to go abroad. So I was telling Jovan, which is just the craziest coincidence, obviously. Uh, you know, now York United, but they were York 9 and my team just based on where my family are based and stuff. And I live in a a, a small kind of town called Barnet, like in North London. Um, And they're like, Barnet are like my local team, but they're in the conference, which is the fifth division in England. So they're like kind of my local team, but they're not my main team, obviously Leeds are. But what I found so crazy is by complete chance, a player, Michael, I can't remember his surname, but Michael something from York, uh, went on loan and he's playing at the moment for Barnet, my local team, which is just the craziest thing. So because of the way the season works, it gives them a chance to go out for, you know, four months, however long, and play without it affecting kind of their season. It actually helps them, you know, stay fit during the off-season. I think it's a great opportunity. And then they come back and play in the summer here or there even. So now we know. Now we know that the level of in, uh, Canadian Premier League is at the fifth division. The, Con- the Vanarama Conference League. No, but I think he's actually done well. So, so you can tell that that's a positive. That you know, you mentioned that's a good point. You know, a lot of people maybe don't think about that too much. The fact that the league goes from like April to October, that allows for potential like a short loan, you know, um, or something like that for for some of the players to get a chance. Um, yeah, let's talk about the national team a little bit because obviously Canada's not had you know never before had such a good chance at qualify for the World Cup in 2022. Um, maybe it would be a better chance if Mitrovic was, was alongside them. Um, I'll say that. <laughs> but uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? What's the, um, what are the likelihood of – how have you seen basically the Canadian national team improve? Uh, obviously, for you, you still are not capped um, for Canada yet. Which um, and and we know, you know, obviously you've had spells uh, with the under under nineteen uh, Serbia camp as well. So, how do you look at that? Obviously, there's two, you know, two two countries of yours that you have to make a decision at some point. But obviously, it's it's not all to you. It's also to you know when the opportunity comes, how it comes, and how do you approach that? So, I'm in talks with with both both um, both national teams at the moment. And now it's just a matter of fact of just uh, thinking about uh, what would be the the best fit for me. And personally, uh, personally, I would I would go for definitely Canada. 
for Canada. I feel that Canada is is what what I mostly feel feel I should do, and yeah, and also with the with the rising of Canada, it's really they really really it's rising. Yeah. To um, to probably the top in the Concacaf, you know. So we yeah. have, all, you have Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David, these kind of players where, you know, like you could you could really compete. And I feel like, without a doubt, uh, we're going to be making World Cups the next five, five, six World Cups. Yeah. Big, big statement, but I think, you know, Canada, you look at it, has a very good chance. Uh, never had a better chance to qualify for, for the World Cup than in 2022. Uh, they'll be there in 2026, uh, you know, automatically. And then, you know, after that, you have two, let's just say, hypothetically, you have two World Cups behind your belt. You have an improving system for the CPL. Uh, players like yourself, obviously, you're born in 2002, so you have, you know, you know, 20, 20, 30 is nothing for you. You know, you'll still be playing. So you look at it and you think that's definitely possible. And the money that comes with it as well for the for the Canada soccer, if they were to be in the World Cup, uh, would be absolutely fantastic for the growth of the sport. Um, the growth of the sport will be, you know, will get, be definitely stimulated with the World Cup being here. Uh, you know, and that's different. That's a totally different conversation. What that means, why there's three teams, there's three countries that are going to be hosting it, and what it means for Canada and the United States and Mexico. But um, but yeah, there, like I think we could talk about the national team for for a while. But but uh, it's exciting stuff. It's definitely not the the depressing stuff that Canada Canada national team yeah, was. The, few, the upcoming few. generations is is getting is getting really strong. Yeah. yeah. And do you think that's your biggest reason for choosing Canada? Just the opportunity to be a part of this kind of like what what may be an infamous rise of um, you know national uh, national team soccer in Canada. Just an opportunity to potentially be a part of that and watch it grow and be like a a piece of that. Yeah, definitely. I would say that uh, the the project that's get, that's being made here in Canada is definitely something where I don't people don't want to miss out on, especially personally me. Because I feel like with this project that, that that we're building here in Canada, it's it, you don't want to miss it. You know what I mean? So so yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And what do you, do you feel that there's um you know obviously you've got Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies, um, who's you know arguably one of the best left backs in the world right now, but undoubtedly going to be one of them in the next couple of years. Um, but do you feel that beyond that there is like a, a strong you know rise of a big group of players coming up? Um, that, you know, you'll have not just two, you know, very good players, but like a very strong team in the next kind of like, you know, five, ten years. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Definitely. Some of my, my best friends, you know, I have a couple of friends here that we're all trying to, trying to all play together, you know, one day. So, you know, and playing yeah. on the same national team, that would be, that'd be crazy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Have you met Alfonso or Jonathan yourself? No, I've, I've never met them. Hopefully soon, though. Uh, yeah, yet, not yeah, but soon, but soon. That's the that's the hope. Um, yeah, obviously Canada's holding the a, a camp, the first camp for a long time, like for, since January. So it's been a whole year since the Canadian national team has has met up. That will be in January, yeah. and uh, so that's going to be exciting. Um, I think moving forward, let's let's talk a little bit. Of, maybe this is kind of uh, uh, greedy to talk about it because obviously it's not too many people. Uh, can relate that much. Uh, but how about you talk about a really prosperous project in Canada, uh, everything going the right way, good, good, good uh, coach behind them, good players. And how much is the decision also the reverse part? Whereas you see Serbia, that is a, obviously we talked about a country that produces good players, uh, has good players on all top five leagues, but they can't qualify for Euros. Um, and that's, that's, really the reality of it how does that come into effect how, how like you want to be at the world cup you don't and you know we're talking about euros now where it's you know it's it's it should be for serbia a, a, a standard that they should be there so how how big is that come into effect well of course it's a big big effect but i mean like when you see these players they're all playing like you said all these massive clubs and we can't make we can't make the euros like i don't know like it's it's kind of strange you know what i mean yeah, but yeah. I don't know that there ha there's something definitely be like going on where like you like don't, people don't know what's what's happening like kind of behind behind the scenes or something but I'm not sure really but I feel like Serbia should be 
should be a country should be a country easily making euros and stuff you know what i mean so <laughs> but yo you you never know we'll see we'll see what what the future brings with uh with serbia you know cuz it's definitely uh also there's also up, upcoming project going going there as well you know with the future players coming around so yeah yeah i think a lot of people you know they they don't want to forget that we won the under 19 uh european championship uh all these years back now and in 2015 they also won uh, the world cup uh the under 20 world cup so typical arsenal yeah. fan clinging on to glory Uh, what it shows for me is that we have the competency but it's about con- turning that into consistency as well. I mean, the fact that you go and you play the Nations League, you beat you you beat you beat a team like Norway, um who was a good footballing team, good like uh, upcoming nation, got good players. We all know who those players are. They beat them. Serbia played, you know, 90 minutes very good, very good football uh and even into the extra time, like good football. Um And then they go and play against Scotland and they play one of the worst games that they've ever played, you know, in a long time. Flat game uh, at home should be easier. They lose that game in penalties. So it just shows even that they played out that 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 uh, badly, they still were able to bring it into a penalty shootout and which it's a lottery after that. Then you look at we play against Russia, a team that's a top footballing nation. Don't care what anyone says, they're a good team. Um strong team you know good good players that are playing in their national domestic league um and we beat them 5-0 serbia goes on to dominate them so it shows that their company's here but the inconsistency shows that there's no real structure around the team uh there's no real um leadership i don't know what's I your thoughts on that i would say as well that i think the problem with serbia is serbs they like the fans you know what i mean they like that atmosphere and uh, without yeah. that without that atmosphere i feel like we're not we're not playing where we where we should be with those fans at the at the stadiums because with those fans you know i know i know serbians like that and they, you know like that that atmosphere that boost that they give them and without that i feel like that put a really big effect on them yeah if there was 50,000 yeah in uh in the stadium against scotland it might have been a different story but it is yeah. what it is what is next what is next and what is next so that's the question right now we're going to ask mitrovic is what is next in the cards right now he's playing his football in niš serbia um you know uh what what is on the cards you know you're still 18 years old so so it's not like you're in any rush whatsoever but where do you see yourself in five years i see myself playing in the in the top five leagues Good answer. Stuff. Good answer. And to the point. that's that's straight yeah. to the point that he's got a top objective in mind, which is key, um, which is great. Now let's think about you know if you know pickers can't be choosers, but uh, let's say pickers can be choosers. What would be your your dream club in five years? Not to say okay, you want to play you know Barcelona in five years. What's a club that you feel that you'd be you'd be super happy with and a level where you can play football? Uh, you think you can get there in five years to a certain level? What club would that be? The two leagues I would want to play in the most would be the, the La Liga or the Premier League. Definitely. Yeah. How about this? How about this? This is an interesting one. You get a you get an offer from Shakhtar, Shakhtar Donetsk, from Ukraine, or okay. you get an offer from Girona in 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 uh, in uh, in Spain, Girona. It plays in Catal- uh, Catalonia. Um, and and Aston Villa. Okay, but that's different. Aston Villa, I would, I would choose Aston Villa. But yeah, what what's your thoughts on that? Girona is more like a no, like you're not like you're playing at Villa, man. You're playing at Villa. Yeah. You're playing at Villa. You know. Feel it. Feel it. So what's your thoughts? What how how do you how do you go through yeah. that? I think go with Girona. You would go with Girona, eh? You wouldn't care about the whole. That. Sorry. No, I wouldn't. I would. Yeah, I wouldn't care. I would definitely pick Girona. In this case, playing in playing in the Spanish. Against all these top teams, while they're playing in Shakhtar, dominating everyone <laughs> against yeah, yeah, teams, yeah. lower teams and stuff. Yeah, it's like, kind of what you're doing now to some degree. I just feel like um, left that big job. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. and you probably for your development too. Let's like be honest, it'd probably be better to yeah. play. Imagine yeah. playing in. Sp- and I think you're also you're the way you, like you're a type you're kind of that type of player that would uh, that would suit Spanish football. I think you know, uh, so yeah. 
Well, uh, and if anyone hasn't ever seen yeah. the games, I know they're not exactly easy for the average Canadian to watch, um, but that is what it is for the average Canadian. Um, but you can watch it. Anyways, um, yeah, so that's basically it, man. We, 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 we uh, overviewed a lot about yourself, where you came from, where you're at, where you want to be. Uh, any last comments? Uh, me, Morgan, what do you think? Uh, yeah, just want to say it's, you know, it's been really interesting today. A very different uh, conversation and discussion to the one we had uh, with Tyrese, um, but still nonetheless really interesting. I'm sure it'll be interesting to the, the UK viewers we have, um, but also more kind of more of more interest and more relatability to, you know, the Canadian followers and any Serbian followers that are watching or may come across our, our channel. Um, I think they'll find it very interesting to hear your thoughts um, and just to get to know you a bit. So, uh, yeah, we really appreciate you coming on. It's a big help to us. Um, and, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, congrats on winning the game. <laughs> we go on. Uh, thanks for watching TFF Plus One. Uh, obviously, into 2021, where we're trying to... Uh, Reinnovate what we do. Obviously, we look at 2022 more of a, a testing year of a pilot program. And uh, obviously, now we got some, we started off with a bang, we got some good guests on. So, anyways, uh, on behalf of the three of us here, great conversation. Uh, see you later. Peace.